Okay, we're looking at Romans chapter 8 today, and of course, we've spent several sessions on chapters 6 and 7, which I have suggested seem to be a parenthesis between chapters 5 and 8, and by that I don't mean to say that they'd simply occupy the space between chapters 5 and 8, which is obvious, but that they are intended as an aside, that where chapter 5 ends, chapter 8 picks up. And in chapter 5, at the end, let's uh, look at uh, verse 20 and 21. In Romans 5, 20, Paul said, Moreover, the law entered that offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he went off and uh, anticipated and addressed certain misconceptions about what it means to say that we uh, that grace abounds, whether that would logically make it a suggestion that we ought to sin more so that grace will abound. Then he also talked about whether being under grace would, uh, as it were, excuse us and allow us to sin because we're not under the law. He talked about that, and he talked about the law itself and what it does and does not accomplish. It is not necessary to have the law in order to keep us righteous because the law was one husband. The the church is married now to a new husband and and he keeps us on the right path as we obey him. We don't have to be under the law. He said the law itself only aggravated the sin problem, he said in chapter 7, and that on one hand it, it condemned behaviors that were already being committed but had not previously been identified as sin, but it also aggravated something in our nature, some rebellion in our nature that that reacts negatively to rules. And so the very rules actually led to uh, passions uh, being inflamed to do things that were forbidden. And so he describes at the end of chapter 7 the frustration of knowing and wanting the right thing in his life, wanting to obey God, but having the frustration of finding that he doesn't do that all the time. Now, I say all the time. He doesn't say exactly how much of the time he's frustrated, and sometimes people who are frustrated much of the time in their Christian life and who find great defects in their walk, they read this perhaps through that lens, and they assume that Paul's talking about somebody who's barely ever doing the right thing, you know, somebody who's always wants to do right but is always doing wrong. Uh... I doubt that there's very many real Christians who remain in that state for very long, but even when you're as old as Paul as a Christian and been walking with God for years and very spiritual, there still are times you don't live up to the standards you agree with. No matter how spiritual you get, you will be able to relate with Romans 7 from time to time because you will find that as as your life actually becomes better, so does your standard go up. The more righteous you are, the more you will understand righteousness and how much more ground there is to conquer than what you've already conquered. So even if Paul was living the most righteous life on the planet, I don't know if he was or not, but he could well have been, he would still have this sense that I'm not always obeying God when I really always want to. And he ends that chapter, of course, in chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, O wretched man that I am, Who will deliver me from the body, this body of death? Now, this body of death may mean his physical body, or it may mean, as it were, the corporate body of Adam that he's a part of, and therefore, because sin reigns in the body of Adam, and he is part of the body of Adam, you know, he wonders when he'll be delivered from that. After all, we have now become part of the body of Christ, but we still have something of Adam's nature in us that we haven't fully shed. And that is why there's a law in our members that brings us into bondage to sin and death, although our minds delight in the law of God. And he says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, which sounds like it should be the end of chapter 7. Sounds like it's the solution. But then the last line that follows that sounds like it's not much of a solution at all, because he says, so then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, (laughs) 
but with the flesh, the law of sin. Well, that was the problem he was complaining about. That's th this whole section, Romans 7, 14 and following, is complaining about that very thing. With my mind, I serve the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. So how is this conclusion a solution to anything? How is it that he thanks Christ for deliverance from this body of death when it sounds like after he's even done so, he says, so this is the way it is. I just serve sin with my body. Well, the key to understanding, I think, his last statement in Romans 7 is the word, I myself. There's no reason for him to stick in the word myself unless it's for emphasis. After all, the sentence would make perfectly good sense. And so then, with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. But he adds, I myself, which implies, it's, it's emphatic, it means of myself, of my own resources. If I'm left to myself, then this is the way it always is. My mind wants to do well, but, my, but I don't do well. My mind serves the law of God, but my flesh still ends up being a slave of sin. That is, when we take into consideration only myself and my resources. He has said back in uh, the earlier chapter, in chapter se earlier in chapter 7, he said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, this is verse 18, nothing good dwells. In me, that is in myself, in my flesh, there's really nothing good. I can't stop sinning. I can't live better in myself. Of myself, my flesh doesn't have any resources to make me better. But... Chapter 8 points out, but I'm not left entirely to myself. The picture changes when we bring into consideration the resource that God has given to his people so that they don't have to serve the law of sin. In fact, he says, of course, in verse 2, that the law of the spirit of life in Christ makes me free from the law of sin and death. So this freedom that he talks about is certainly part of his answer to the question, who will deliver me from this body of death? Chapter 8 opens with a statement about condemnation, which is in contrast to justification. And therefore, he begins by reaffirming justification. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, the last line of verse 1, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, is not found in the older manuscripts. It is found in all manuscripts at the end of chapter uh, verse 4. Verse 4 has the same line at the end. But the older manuscripts only have it at the end of verse 4 and not at the end of verse 1. So there would be some question as to whether Paul said that line twice, namely at the end of verse 1 and at the end of verse 4, or whether he only wrote it at the end of verse 4, but someone copying the manuscripts decided to take that line and clarify verse 1 because perhaps they felt like it's too absolute to say there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Some, some copyist, some scribe, may have stuck in who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit because he wanted to make sure it was not too, uh, he didn't want it to be too libertine. He wanted to make sure that it's qualified. But it would appear from the older manuscripts, Paul didn't put in that line at the end of verse 1. He simply said, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, period. Being in Christ Jesus means you're in the new man. Christ is righteous, and therefore if, that is your, if that's your identity, God has taken you and placed you in Christ, then you are righteous in him, and therefore there can be no condemnation to you. But he doesn't develop that beyond this point. Why? Because he's done that in chapters 1 through 5. That's been his primary focus, is justification. He's just returned to it, to re I think, to reconnect with where he left off at chapter 5, and to move on from there. You know, let's, let's restate that. You might remember back in chapter uh, 5, that he started saying something in verse 12. He broke off the sentence, went into a long parenthesis, which is chapter 5, verses 13 through 17, and then he, re he, he revisited what he started to say in verse 12, but he had to start over again, so that in chapter 5, verse 18, he restated what he said in 12. We're talking about chapter 5 here now, that... In chapter 5, verse 18, he has to restate what he began to say in verse 12 because he had had such a long parenthesis, he assumes the reader probably has lost track of what he started to say, so let's start that over again. 
So in chapter 5, verse 12, he says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned, that's not a complete sentence. It breaks off. He goes off into this long parenthesis in verses 13 through 17. And once he comes back to his subject, he has to state the, the first part again in verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Okay, now we can move forward. And he, and he does. But the point is, Paul is given to long explanatory parentheses. And he's done the same thing with a much longer parenthesis between the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 8. And certainly has given his reader time to forget what his last point was in chapter 5. And so I believe when he picks up his discussion again at the end of the parenthesis in chapter 8, verse 1, he returns to what he has said and basically summarizes all that was said before, verse, before chapter 6. And that is, there's justification in Christ. There's no condemnation in Christ. Okay, now there's more that we need to discuss. Because... There is the issue of living victoriously over sin, which justification in itself does not address. Justification addresses the expunging of the sin record, the criminal record, uh, the, the removal of guilt from past sin. That's a wonderful thing. And, you know, frankly, if God just kept doing that all the time and we lived in sin and he just kept forgiving us, Perhaps for some people that would consider good enough. You know, I can live how I want to. I can live in sin. God will just keep forgiving. And that's the things that Paul was refuting in chapter 6, isn't it? You know, let's just keep living in sin so grace may abound. He said, no, that's not the way it works. You've died to sin. That's why you're, the reason that you are not condemned is because you have died in Christ to sin. And you live to righteousness. And you're a slave of righteousness now, not a slave of sin. And he went into all that. So lack of condemnation is one thing, but it's not everything. You need to also realize that you're called to live without sin. You're called to live unto God. You're a slave of righteousness. You're supposed to obey righteousness. But Paul has been saying in chapter 7, that's, not, that's easier said than done. It's easier wished than performed. How am I supposed to do that? And there is an answer to that. It goes beyond simply the matter of justification to what is often called sanctification. Now, Paul is not using the word sanctification uh, for this process. It's a term that theologians usually use for it, and there's nothing wrong with doing so. Sanctification means to become holy or to be holy. And so if it, if it comes down to, now that I'm forgiven, how do I become a holy person in my behavior, in my life? The answer is going to be found in the work of the Holy Spirit, which now is mentioned over 20 times in chapter 8. The Holy Spirit is mentioned over 20 times in chapter 8. Prior to chapter 8, the Holy Spirit's only been mentioned four times in the whole book of Romans. So in chapters 1 through 7, there are four passing references to the Holy Spirit. No teaching, but just references to him. But now in chapter 8, 20 times or more, I say the reason I don't know the exact number is because sometimes Paul uses the word spirit additional. That might be referring to the Holy Spirit, but might be the human spirit. It's not always easy to tell because the word is the same in the Greek. But at least 20 times in chapter 8, he is clearly referring to the Holy Spirit. Now, he referred to the Holy Spirit in passing earlier. In chapter 7, for example, he says in chapter 7, verse 6, But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now that we serve God in the newness of the spirit, he did not explain there. He, was taught, he had to go on and talk about something else at that point. But now he is. Because in the verses just before chapter 7, verse 6, chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, he had been talking about being married, married to the law, died to the law, married to another, bearing fruit for God. He's basically introduced the idea that our righteous life is not a product of living under law, but of bearing fruit. That means there must be a change of nature. Fruit is produced by a certain kind of nature. A good nature produces good fruit. Bad nature, bad fruit. The change has to be internal. 
There has to be a, a change in nature or else there will not be good fruit. A person who doesn't have a good nature can live well up to a point if the laws upon him are imposed and, and enforced. But that doesn't change him. It just makes him more resentful of the fact that he can't do what he really is ur feeling the urge to do. But if you change who he is inwardly, then you don't need the external laws to make him righteous. He'll, be, he'll live righteously from a righteous impulse, from an inside righteousness. Remember in Jeremiah 31, God said in the New Covenant, he's going to write his laws on their hearts and on their inward parts. The idea being, instead of imposing an external law on a rebellious heart, he's going to transform the heart so those laws are built in, factory installed in the heart, which is a figure that would suggest the inner nature is already inclined toward those laws. They're built into the nature of the new heart that God gives. And therefore, the fruit of our lives is righteous behavior. And he had said way back in chapter 6, verse 21, in 621, he said, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you're now ashamed? Your past life had bad fruit. You're ashamed of it now. There was no good fruit there. But now, in chapter 7, in verse 4, he said, we're married to one who's risen from the dead that we might bear fruit a different kind of fruit for God. This fruit comes from a, a new nature, and this new nature comes from the Holy Spirit. And so that's why he said in chapter 7, verse 6, now we've been delivered from the law, that is, we don't have to keep the law because there's something else that keeps us holy, something other than the law. What, well, what is that? Well, we're serving God in the newness of the Spirit and not the oldness of the letter. Now, the letter simply is a phrase or an expression that Paul uses to mean the imposition of a written code. It's not that there's some written code imposed, a letter of law, but rather there's a change inside brought about by the Spirit, and that new life of the Spirit is what produces a new kind of fruit. And he's going to explain that now. He, as I said, he said it only in passing in chapter 7. Now he's got time to actually look at that as a main subject. Having returned to the subject of justification in chapter 8, verse 1, so that we have no condemnation now. But let's look beyond that. What does it mean to live in the newness of the Spirit? How do we live a life free from sin? And the answer is, and we talked about this at the end of the last session, well, we live free from sin provisionally, not automatically, by walking in the Spirit. This is a walk, and like any walk, it is consisting of individual steps. When you are walking, each step has to be taken individually. You may take a thousand steps in a row that are successful, and your next one you might twist your ankle or trip over a crack in the sidewalk and go down. You never can say, now I'm walking so well, I never need to worry about stumbling. James said in many things, we all stumble. You never get to the place where stumbling is not a problem, or not, I should say, not a danger. And that's because there's always the law of gravity. There's always the law of sin still in your members until we're delivered from it through resurrection. And Paul talks about how we groan looking forward to that later in Romans 8 and verse 23. But in the meantime, before we're resurrected, before we are freed from the law of sin, our members, we have another law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which has been made available the Spirit of Christ given to us inwardly is a resource that is more powerful than the law of sin and death. Why? Well, Jesus showed himself to be more powerful than sin and death by not sinning and by rising from death. He has conquered both. And having done so, the life that he gives us in his spirit is capable of overcoming this uh, other force in our members. And so he says in verse 2 of Romans 8, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And I mentioned last time that this doesn't mean, okay, I crossed a certain threshold in my spiritual journey, and having crossed that threshold, I'm now free for the rest of my life from the law of sin and death. It's rather this Spirit makes me overcome sin and death and frees me from its bondage and power as I walk in the Spirit. But as with all walking, 
it's a, it's a matter of individual steps. Every day for the rest of my life, every decision I make, every step I take in the life has to be in the spirit or else it won't be. And if it isn't, then the law of sin and death still has every bit as much claim on my behavior because only the spirit of God can overcome the power of the flesh. I can't do it myself. That's why he closed chapter 7 by saying, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but the law of sin with my flesh, I, if it's left to me. I'm not stronger than me. That's the problem. Sin in me is part of me. And I can't beat me because I'm not stronger than me. I'm about equal to me because I am me. So there has to be some external power, external to me, that is something that isn't strictly me, but comes from elsewhere. And that is the power, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is given to me. And as I exploit that law, as I live according to that power, as I am doing so, as I am walking in the spirit, I am not at the same time walking in the flesh. As I am walking in the spirit, I'm not at the same time stumbling. If I stumble, it's only because I stopped walking in the spirit at that moment. And I need to start again. So Paul said in Galatians 5.17, I say then walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the power over the law of sin in my flesh is this spirit of God. And I need to walk in the spirit. Now the question naturally arises, what does that mean to walk in the spirit? It's a nice Christian cliche, but unless I know what it means and it's not automatic and therefore I'm required to do something in order to do it, what is it I have to do? Well, Paul will come in this chapter to the answer to the, that question, but I, I, just by way of anticipation, I'll tell you. Walking is a great metaphor for what he's talking about because life is a walk. And in fact, it is such a good metaphor that it's used lots of times in the scripture in different ways. Walk worthy of the calling that you are called. Walk, we walk by faith not by sight. Walk in love. Walk this way. Walk in the steps of faith that Abraham walked in, it says in chapter 4. Life is like a walk. And you can talk about different aspects of life as different kinds of walking. Walking in love, walking in faith, walking in whatever, in the Spirit. All of these things are, of course, part of what it means to walk in the Spirit, in the Christian life. Walking in Christ by the power of His Spirit involves faith and love and worthy behavior and so forth. But why is this metaphor such a good one? Well, because just like walking is made up of a series of individual steps, life is made up of a series of individual moments and choices. Every time we make a choice, it's going to be either a good one or a bad one. If we're in the flesh, or if, we're, if we make a choice in the flesh, then it's not likely to be a good choice we are in the spirit when we're making that choice we're we're walking that moment also in the spirit but it's a we don't ever just like i said cross the threshold and say okay now we can put on cruise control and maybe i'll take a nap while the while we make this journey no we have to keep our eyes open be diligent be vigilant be sober because there are spiritual dangers and there is a devil who's trying to trip you up and he'll appeal to your flesh and he'll distract your mind and he'll do what he can to make you forget what you're supposed to believe and what you're supposed to count on and what you're supposed to do. And so there's, a, uh, there's an ongoing responsibility just as there is with walking naturally. Now we walk naturally so, we've done it so much of our lives, we don't realize even the individual steps we're taking most of the time. If you're walking and talking with someone, you're taking a whole bunch of steps you're not even thinking about your steps. You're talk, thinking about the conversation or something else, but you still take them successfully because it's so habitual. But you can never count on walking so habitually well that you would never stumble because it's just at times like that that you might if you encounter an obstacle, a stumbling block in the way that you, if you're not paying attention, you will go down. And we all do that. We all stumble, James said. And the reason we do is not because we had to, but because it's awfully hard to keep our attention on what it's supposed to be on all the time. We're easily distracted. And we have times when we're weaker than other times. Times when it doesn't matter as much to us as it should. 
and we're not fighting the fight. We'd rather just kind of cave in and take the path of least resistance. There are lots of things that cause us not always to walk in the Spirit. So it is, of course, the case that life is a series of moments, and each moment is an opportunity to continue to walk or not walk in the Spirit, to take another step as we should or not to do so or to stumble. Now, walking as a metaphor works for a number of reasons because when you are actually walking somewhere, two things are involved. The two things that are involved in walking always are, one, having somewhere to go. You will not get up out of that chair and leave it unless you want to go someplace. And you will either, I mean, you'll have someplace you're aiming at. You might not know where you want to go when you just want to get off your bottom and give it a rest. But before you move anywhere, you'll have a direction. You'll have chosen a direction. You'll either go that way or that way or some other way, or you won't move at all. You have to have some kind of direction in order to walk. If you have no goal, then you're not walking, you're just wandering. Walking is a means of transporting yourself from one place to another. And if you're walking, you know where it is you want to go. You know which direction you're going to walk. Now, in others, you have to have some kind of guidance system. Normally for us, since we are not blind, we have eyes. We look and we say, okay, that's where I want to get to. And so we, get, we go that direction. Or I need to turn at that corner. I can see where it is. Seeing where we're going is a very important part of walking. If you were blind and had not been blind for very long and therefore had not adjusted, if you were suddenly made blind this moment and had to walk, you'd be bumping into things and you wouldn't get where you want to go at all. Of course, people who have been blind for a longer time, they find other ways to guide themselves. But everyone needs a guidance system in order to walk in a desired direction. And so walking in the Spirit similarly requires that we're directed by the Spirit. When we physically walk, we're directed by our eyesight. Walking in the Spirit is simply following the leading of the Holy Spirit, letting Him decide what it is we're going to do. That's one aspect of walking. Of course, the other aspect is you have to have the power to do it. You may be sitting in a chair and thinking, I think I want to go right over there. I can see the very spot I want to get to. But if you're, uh, if you're crippled and, and you're in a wheelchair, uh, you're not going to get up and walk there because you don't have the strength in your legs or whatever. You need to have the strength to walk. Uh, again, we do this so much we don't even think about it unless we get extremely exhausted. I remember a couple of times... Actually, I can remember three times in my life where I've gone on long hikes with people who were in shape, and I wasn't. And I, I didn't have any idea what it was like to come to the actual end of all of your energy. I'd never reached the total end of all my energy before. I didn't take enough food with me, didn't have enough calories in me. We were walking like 12 miles or something like that in, in the mountains, and uh, I, I just hadn't done, I hadn't done that and, and prepared for it. And I remember getting to a place where I, walking was such an accomplishment. Every step was a difficulty. Uh, you very rarely, rarely come to that point in most cases if you're in good health. But when you've walked and haven't had enough calories, you get to a place where your, your body just doesn't have more energy. And literally, I remember times thinking, they're keeping on ahead of me, but I don't know if I can move this leg one more step. And it wasn't hurting. It wasn't like I was in pain. Or it was just like, I just don't know if I have the energy to swing that leg forward again. And then the next one. And I actually was surprised that a person could become so depleted of energy. Just because I've so seldom been in that position. I've had it happen three times in the woods. Fortunately, they had some candy bars or something to give me some more energy, and I was able to get going again. But it, it became clear to me what doesn't usually become clear to me, and that is that you have to have energy. You have to have power to walk. You can't just walk because you want to. You have to be able to do it. You have to have the power. And so walking in the Spirit requires direction and ability, power. And both of those things are aspects of what Paul's talking about, of walking in the Spirit. If you look just for the moment, a few verses ahead of us, where we are, he says in verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, You've got to put to death the deeds of the body, but you do it through the Spirit, meaning by the power of the Holy Spirit. Walking in the Spirit requires being empowered 
by the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural ability. But then the next verse, verse 14, Romans 8, 14, Paul says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So the guidance of the Spirit. You're being led by the Spirit of God. This is what Paul means by walking in the Spirit. The Spirit is leading you. That is, you're getting your direction from him, and he's enabling you. You're getting your power from him. Now, how does that happen? Well, we'll explore that as we read on. But just so you understand, Paul's saying this problem of falling into sin when I really wanted to do better is actually something that can be remedied provisionally, step by step. You don't just throw a switch and suddenly it's gone. The problem's gone, and now I'm a sin-free person. But it is something that as I determine to walk in the Spirit with God, that he gives me the power and the guidance to live in a way that's different than my flesh would live and to overpower it. And if I walk in the Spirit, I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So this is the process of being living a holy life, sometimes called sanctification, and is in contrast, therefore, with justification, which only is really talking about being forgiven and being relieved of the guilt. Now we're talking about the power of sin, not the guilt of sin, and the power of the Spirit to overcome it. So the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. So this is the opposite. The the law and the flesh together did not have the power to do what's right. The law could not empower me, and my flesh was weakened by this law of sin in me. Therefore, the weakness of the law and of my flesh could not get the job done, could not help me to live a holy life. But what the law could not do, God did through his spirit, of course, being given, and through Jesus. God did by sending his own son, and in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, and therefore this sin in my flesh has no more rule. It's been condemned as in in Adam, and I'm in Christ, and the spirit of Christ is, is what enlivens me, what gives me the life and the power to do what I do, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, when it says the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, in verse 4, we encountered this phrase back in chapter 2 when Paul was talking to the Jew and how that the Jew, though he was, in fact, circumcised, they didn't necessarily live up to the law. And so Paul talked about those who are not circumcised and yet who... uh, fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. I'm looking now for that particular verse. It's verse 26, chapter 2, verse 26. Paul said, Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? The Christian, if they're not a Jewish Christian, is an uncircumcised person who nonetheless keeps the righteous requirements of the law. And that's what Paul says we do as we walk in the Spirit. We fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. Those of us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Romans 8, 4. Now, he amplifies on this in verses 5 and following. He says, for those who live according to the flesh, he means in the power of the flesh and according to the guidance of the flesh. This is simply referring to walking in the flesh instead of in the Spirit. People who do that set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, living according to seems to be a reference to having one's life by. Do you have your life by the flesh, or do you have your life by the Spirit? Has the the, uh, Spirit given you life? Because Paul also says elsewhere in Galatians, it's very near the end of Galatians. I don't have the verse number in my notes. 525. 525. Thank you very much. If we live in the Spirit or by the Spirit, let us also walk in or by the Spirit. The Spirit is the source of our life in Christ. And therefore, he's also the source of our strength and guidance and so forth and our walk. So he says, if we're living according to the flesh, that's not living according to the Spirit. We have a new life in the Spirit since we're Christians, and that enables us to live according to that life. 
in verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now in the flesh, of course, means living according to the fleshly life. And that's not really talking specifically about the behavior as the source of life itself. If you don't have the spirit enlivening you, if you're not born again, if you're just an unregenerate person, then you're living according to fleshly life. There's nothing else there. If you are born again, you have the spirit so you can live according to the spirit and by the spirit's life in you. But he says, he speaks specifically here about being carnally minded and spiritually minded. And this has to do with what you're setting your mind on. Are your, is, are your thoughts and desires and values those of the flesh? In other words, what are you aiming at? What are you valuing in your life? What direction have you pointed yourself at? Are you seeking wealth and comfort and earthly, fleshly things? Well, then your mind's on the things of the flesh. Are you seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, seeking to be holy, seeking to influence others for godliness, uh, seeking to raise your children for holiness? I mean, if, you're, if your thoughts are on spiritual things, well, then that's life and peace. Otherwise, you're just on the path that isn't Christian, and you're still in the flesh, not yet really apparently born of God. You're still in the flesh and not in the spirit because your mind is set on carnal things. Being born again does change where your mind is. That's why Paul in Romans 7, even when he was talking about the frustration he had, he said in verse 22, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. And then he referred to that delight in the law of God to be the law of his mind in verse 23. Romans 7, 23, but I see another law in my members, meaning the sin, warring against the law of my mind. What's the law of my mind? It's the one that I choose with my mind. I, I, I embrace God's law, God's holiness, because I'm a born-again person. I have a changed heart and direction and mind. But if I'm not born again, I'm not going to be delighting in those things. So the one who's in the flesh, living by the power of the flesh, is not born again, and their mind is going to be strictly on fleshly things, carnal things, and, the, and that's death. It's going to result in death. It's not going to, that's, that's not salvation, to be carnally minded. But to be spiritually minded, that's because a person who lives according to the Spirit, verse 5, sets his mind on the things of the Spirit. If you're born again and you have spiritual life in you, your mind, your direction, your values are going to be aimed toward the things of God. If they aren't, then rebirth apparently has not yet happened. Now, of course, you do have a body, and fleshly things are going to make their appeal to you. That's called temptation. But your real goals, your dominant desires, are going to be those that are desiring to be spiritual, desiring to please God and to be in connection with God. So that's life and peace, to be spiritually minded like that. And in verse 7, he says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. The person who's only thinking about fleshly things is thinking about things that are contrary to spiritual things and contrary to God himself. So they can't be subject to the law of God. That carnal mind is not subject to the law of God and cannot be. Why? Because it's aimed against God. It's aimed at the things of the flesh, not at the things of God or the spirit. So the person who is un not born again is the person who really can't live according to the law of God. And he says in verse 8, so then those who are in the flesh, again, he means unconverted, and we see that especially that that's what he means in the next verse because he says, because you're not in the flesh but in the spirit if you, if you have the spirit of God in you and you're a Christian. So in the flesh means not a Christian. In the spirit means a Christian. And he says, so then those who are in the flesh, that's not Christians, cannot please God. Now before going on to Paul's contrast in the next verse, I would say that this verse is one of the favorite proof texts for a man that I once debated on the subject of Calvinism. He's a Calvinist, and he, he always likes to bring this verse up. He thinks it's the real, the real clincher for the doctrine of uh, total inability, which is part of total depravity. The, do the Calvinist doctrine is that if you're totally depraved, it means you're totally unable 
to do anything. You're dead in trespasses. You're totally unable to do anything that pleases God. And this actually says a non-Christian person cannot please God. And so even the doctrine of Calvinism is that the unregenerate person can't even believe. I mean, they can't even do that much. Can't even just choose to believe God. And this gentleman says, well, the Bible says in Hebrews that faith pleases God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And if the un unsaved person can't please God, then that means he can't believe. But this is reading far more into the statement than Paul is actually intending to say. He's saying that those who are in the flesh cannot live a life pleasing to God. This is what's under discussion. How do I live a life pleasing to God? I can desire it, but there's this power of sin in me that prevents me from doing it. And what all that Paul's saying is that living in the flesh is never going to provide a solution. If you're in the flesh, unborn again, your, your desires are not the sort that are going to end up with a life pleasing to God. You can't live subject to the law of God, and therefore you can't live pleasing to God. But again, this pl cannot please God is not saying you can't do a single thing that would ever please God. Cornelius was unregenerated when the angel came to him and said his sacrifices were pleasing to God. An unbeliever, apparently, if he wishes, can do some things pleasing to God, but he can't live a life consistently pleasing to God. Neither can a Christian unless they walk in the Spirit. But Paul is not addressing the question of whether an unbeliever can believe or repent. He's talking about living a life. And living the life that is holy is not possible for a person who's in the flesh, not born again. That's all that Paul's saying. It's very clear that's what he's saying because he equates cannot please God with cannot be subject to the law of God in the previous verse. He said the carnal mind cannot be subject to the law of God, therefore that person cannot please God. So he's not asking whether a non-Christian really has the capacity to repent or to believe or anything like that. Paul in chapter 7 had repented and believed, but he still couldn't live that life that he wanted to live in himself, in his own flesh. So this is irrelevant really to the point that that particular person is trying to make. He's not arguing, no, they can't believe. He's saying they can't live according to the law of God. They can't, they can't fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. Why? Because they have sin in their flesh, but they don't have, they don't have the law of the power uh, of the life of Christ in, in the spirit uh, to help them. So in contrast to the unbeliever who's in the flesh and cannot do that, verse 9 says, but you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Now, it's very clear that having the Spirit of Christ is a qualification for being a Christian. And if you are in that state of having the Spirit, then you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. So you're a Christian if you're in the Spirit. You're a non-Christian if you're in the flesh. And also, Paul interestingly uses a number of synonyms that are helpful to us because we talk about Jesus living in your heart. The Bible doesn't, but sometimes people talk about accepting Jesus into your heart. The Bible does say that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. But how can this be if Jesus really is at the right hand of God in heaven and we're waiting for him to return? Where is he actually? Is he sitting at the right hand of God and the heavens must retain him until the time of the restoration of all things? It's like Peter said in Acts 3, that he can't come back until it's time. Well, if he can't, then who's this living inside of me? Why does the Bible speak of, on rare occasions, Jesus being in my heart? Well, Paul makes it very clear what he means by that. Because he says in verse 10, and if Christ is in you. Now, that's, that's a given. He's not in verse 10 arguing that Christ is in you. He's assuming that that's, that's the starting point for what he's about to prove. If Christ is in you, which is a given, then the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, if Christ is in you is the summary of the previous verse. You are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. If the spirit of God dwells in you, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his, and thus, if Christ is in you, notice how he's used these phrases interchangeably. The Spirit of God is in you, 
You have the Spirit of Christ. Therefore, Christ is in you. The Spirit that is in you is Christ's Spirit. He lives in you through His Spirit. His resurrected, glorified body, I think we are to assume, is still what is up there at the right hand of God waiting to come back. But his spirit has been sent, and this spirit is the spirit of God, also called the spirit of Christ. Also called Christ. Jesus doesn't physically live inside of me in his resurrected body. It's more like I live in him. But his spirit resides in everybody who's in him. Because a person's spirit permeates their whole body. And, you know, that's the life of the flesh, is the spirit. The body without the spirit is dead, James said. So... Christ's entire body is infused with his spirit. And if you're in him, in his body, then you are infused with his spirit. And his spirit is in you. You're not in the flesh. You've got a different power, the power of God's spirit, of Christ, in you. And he says, because of that, in verse 10, if Christ is in you, then the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, it's not clear in this contrast, in this particular place, a contrast between body and spirit, whether he's talking about individual body and individual spirit or the larger picture of Adam's body and Christ's body, which is equated with the spirit. I don't know. Uh, it's a strange thing to say the body is dead and to mean your body because your body isn't literally dead. On the other hand, we have already encountered places in Scripture, even in Romans 7, where dead was not literal, not speaking of being a physically dead person, but being as good as dead. That is to say, it's, it's predictably dying. It's dead. Just like I mentioned when, when God said to Abimelech, you're a dead man. Or when Mephibosheth said to David, when David showed him kindness, he says, why should you show kindness to a dead dog like me? Dead... Mephibosheth was part of the previous administration. Normally speaking, when a new king came up and replaced the old administration, he purged all the relatives of the old king because they might rise up against him. But David instead took this doomed character, son of Absalom, grandson of Saul, and said, I'm going to keep you around and let you eat at my table. He said, I'm a dead dog. How can you show such mercy to a dead dog like me? Mephibosheth's standing in society once David became king was as good as dead, frankly. I mean... That's what kings do. They, they seek out and purge all the members of the previous administration's family. So they don't have any one loyal to the old family saying, hey, this is the new king. We're going to raise him up instead of David. But uh, the point is that people are called dead when, in fact, it means they're as good as dead. And Paul might mean that here. Since Christ is in me, my body is as good as dead. It's not really reached the point of being literally dead yet, but it's inevitable but my spirit, not, not so. My spirit is not dead. It's, it's life. It's going to live on because of righteousness, Christ's righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, verse 11, dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, the spirit of Christ is the spirit also of God who raised him from the dead. And that spirit dwells in us. This means that the one who dwells in us is capable of and has already once done this, raised the dead. And he is therefore capable and, and promised to raise us from the dead too. However, it's not entirely clear if Paul at this point is introducing the idea of the physical resurrection of the dead, which has not been mentioned previously in Romans, but will be, at least that, that is what is spoken of in verse 23, I believe, when he talks about the redemption of our body. I believe that's the resurrection of the dead. Paul here could be introducing that early. The idea of, you know, we're going to someday be resurrected from the dead too. It's not only that the Spirit of God in me helps me overcome sin in my life day by day, but additionally, the day will come when I'll be delivered from this body entirely by resurrection. In answer to Paul's question in Romans 7.24, who will deliver me from this body of death? The answer is God's spirit who dwells in me will deliver me from this body of death by giving life to my mortal body in the resurrection. Now, this is entirely possibly Paul's meaning, but I've wondered about that because 
of his specific wording. He doesn't say, he who raised Jesus from the dead will raise you from the dead, though this is true, and Paul could easily have said it, but he didn't say it that way. He said, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, therefore he will give life to your mortal body. Now, once he raised you from the dead, it isn't a mortal body. It could be said to be it was a mortal body, then he gave life to it, then it became immortal. But he might be saying that while you're living in your mortal body, you'll have a new life given by the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. There's a resurrection life in you now that your body today is enlivened by the spirit of life that raised Jesus from the dead and therefore, in a sense, a life that has already conquered death, a life that is already a resurrection, supernatural, glorified life. My body has not yet been transformed, but my inner man has been. Remember when Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, though our outward man is perishing, our inner man is being renewed day by day. Remember that verse? That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse um, 16. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. There's this new improving side of me. Every day I'm getting better and better in the inward man, though the outward man's going the other direction. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. The spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is in me, and he's giving this resurrection life to me as I live in this mortal body. That could certainly be Paul's meaning, and I think it would actually... Although seeing verse 11 as being about the resurrection would not be a problem, but I'm not sure that, that he's gotten to that, that thought yet in Romans 8. Especially in view of what he says afterwards in verse 12, he says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Meaning we, we don't owe the flesh anything. What did it ever do for you but you know, condemn you? You don't owe anything to your flesh. And you might keep that in mind when you're tempted to do something to gratify the flesh, think, what do I owe it? Why should I please my flesh? It's never been a friend of mine. I'm not a debtor to it. But more than just saying I'm not a debtor, it means that I don't have to obey it. And that might be, he starts with therefore, which might mean from the previous verse, because I have the resurrection life living in my mortal body, I have the option of not obeying the flesh. I have the option of living in the spirit instead of the flesh. So I'm under no obligation, under no debt to live according to the flesh. Now, by the way, I do have a debt to God. I'm very much indebted to him, which makes, again, an argument for living in the spirit rather than in the flesh, because that's what I owe God. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body... You will live. Now, the deeds of the body here would speak specifically, obviously, of the sinful deeds of the body. And I think some translations or paraphrases add another word besides just deeds of the body, like sinful deeds of the body or something of that sort. That's certainly what Paul means. He's saying that we need to put to death those demands of the flesh that are contrary to what we should be doing. We know what we're supposed to be doing. We need to put that to death. But how do I do that? Now, see, many people who, who teach holiness, uh, you know, they revert back to chapter 6 where it says count yourself dead to sin. And so they say putting it to death means you just have to put yourself in the mental state of saying it's dead, it's dead, it's dead. You know, I'm not going not gonna to listen to it, it's dead. And there is maybe some value in that, but I'm not sure that's what Paul's saying. Putting to death the deeds of the body, I think, just means denying yourself. I mean, saying, okay, the body wants to do these things, I'm just going to deaden it. I'm not, that is, I'm not going to dignify it with any uh, claims. It's a dead man making claims that dead men don't have. Adam is crucified, and my body wants to follow him, but that's dead. That's a dead man. I'm going to just realize that these things, the, the sins of the body, are part of Adam, and Adam's dead, so I'm just going to personally put them to death, mortify them. The, the language that Paul uses is difficult, but it, basically I think what he's saying is when the, when the flesh is uh, you know, making its demands 
we need to walk in the Spirit. And that's what he says more about in the next two verses, that uh, even in this verse, if through the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. What's that really? How, how does that work? I believe what he means by that is that the Spirit of God enables us to do it as we trust him to do it. When I'm facing temptation, it might be the hardest thing to do is to remember to just trust God. That this is going to, if, if I just look to God, he will give me this, the ability not to do this. We sometimes get so scared in the face of a temptation that we're trying to avoid and think, oh no, I don't have what it takes to, I'm, this is going to beat me, you know. That's the devil, of course, lying and, and trying to get you to cave in. When you don't have to, if you trust God, say, well, God's going to give me the victory. I have the Spirit of God in me. I, I'm going to live from the Spirit that's in me rather than these fleshly habits that I have. Uh, if the Spirit of God really is in you, then he can and will give you the power as you're trusting him to do it. Being enabled by the Spirit is a matter of faith, trusting him. We walk by faith. We trust him to empower us and to guide us. He says in verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now, led by the Spirit of God, we could go at length at that if we had the time, which we don't. What does it mean to be led by the Spirit of God? Let me just really quickly say this, and we'll be done for this, this session. Many people, when they think about being led by the Spirit of God, they're thinking of something very subjective, something that the mind is very much aware of. I'm hearing voices in my head, the Spirit saying yes or no about this, or... I'm, I'm getting some revelatory guidance from God. I don't know in the Bible if that's very commonplace. Paul was certainly a man led by the Spirit, but how was he led? Well, different ways. Sometimes I'm sure he just followed what he knew the Scripture said. After all, what spirit was it that inspired the Scriptures? It was the Spirit of God. So if I'm properly following what the scripture says am i not following what the spirit of god is leading isn't he the one who gave these words isn't he the one who gives these instructions in the bible he's the inspirer of it in a sense if i allow the scriptures properly understood to provide my goals and policies and so forth i'm being led by the scriptures by the, well that's by the spirit of god but not that's not the only way Certainly being led by the Spirit isn't simply a matter of obeying the written word, but that's not absent from the concept. Following what the Scripture says is certainly, when you are doing it, following what the Spirit of God has directed through the writers of Scripture. But there's also more individual and subjective ways that he leads too. I mean, Paul, at one time when his companions were trying to decide where to go from Troas, and they decided to go into Asia, but the Spirit forbade them. Then they tried to go into Bithynia, and he forbade them to do that too. And they thought, well, now where do we go? And one of them in the team had a dream of a man from Macedonia saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so they, they concluded that's what God's telling them to do. And so they went to Macedonia. Now think of what they were going through subjectively during that time trying to figure out which direction we're we supposed to go here. We want to be led by the Spirit. Let's, let's try, let, I think Asia sounds good, so let's try that. Nope, the Spirit wouldn't let him go. What's that mean? I don't know. Maybe he closed the doors. They weren't able to go that direction. Maybe he just made them not have a peace about it. The Spirit may guide by inward impressions, by peace. After all, peace is a fruit of the Spirit. If you don't have a peace about it, that's what some people call about having a check in the Spirit. That's sort of a, uh, that, that's not a biblical word, but, but Christians often have used the term, at least in older days, of, I got a check about that meaning I don't have the peace of it. The peace of the Spirit of God is not in me about that. I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying no. It's not a clear word. It's just I don't feel totally good in the conscience about it. It seems like maybe this isn't right. I, don't, I can't go forward with full assurance that this is God's leading. But they tried that a couple different directions. Once they tried to go to Asia, once they tried to go to Bethlehem, both times the Holy Spirit stopped them, which means, of course, that they were feeling they were being led by the Spirit, but had to be corrected. They wouldn't have struck out in those directions in the first place if they didn't think that's what the Holy Spirit was leading them. But they obviously didn't have a clear word. So they were experimenting, thinking, I think maybe God's leading us to go this way. Oops, nope. How about this way? Nope, that's wrong too. And finally, God actually gave a dream, and that's how he led them. But he doesn't always do that. 
Most of Paul's direction in his ministry was not given through dreams and visions, but obviously that's one of the options. The Holy Spirit can lead a lot of different ways. Simply by giving you a peace about it, by guiding you through scriptural teaching and principle, by even supernatural dreams and visions and prophecies. God can give direction that way too. We shouldn't hold out for the latter just because it's the most exciting. A lot of people, especially charismatic people, feel like, you know, I, I want to get a word from the Lord before I do anything. And by that, they mean sort of like a revelatory prophetic word that's almost so clear that they could quote it verbatim if they wished because it's that clear. But uh, in many cases, the leading of the Spirit is much more subtle than that. You know what to do because the Bible says what to do. Or you think you should do such a thing, it feels right, but then it doesn't feel right. And you just can't move that way without this check in your conscience about it. I don't have a peace about that. Or you get an actual <laughs> prophecy. There are prophecies and dreams and visions and angels even. I mean, we, have, we know of cases in the Bible where God made his will known through those ways. But those are very exceptional. As you read the book of Acts, you don't find these angels and dreams and visions guiding the apostles every step of the way. They're, they're exceptional cases, but they can happen. The point is, when you do know what the Spirit wants you to do, whichever way he has made it known to you, you walk in that way. You are led by that Spirit. In other words, you choose that as the direction for your walk. And you're being obedient to God and trusting him to enable you to do it. That's walking in the Spirit. And as you are, at any moment you're doing that, you will not be fulfilling the works of the flesh. And that's the power that he gives for it. Now, we're going to take a break here. And when we come back, we're going to see how Paul goes off a little bit on the subject of being sons of God and what that means. And we're going to finish out the chapter. We're not quite halfway through, but we'll probably finish out the chapter next time. Mm -hmm. 